Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guest today is Mike Mazar. He's a senior political scientist at the RAND Corporation, which is a nonprofit global think tank that was created to offer research and analysis to the U.S. Armed Forces. He earned a B.A. in government and an M.A. in security studies from Georgetown, go Hoyas, and a Ph.D. in public policy from the University of Maryland, go Terps. Dr. Mazar is the author of Leap of Faith, Hubris, Negligence, and America's Greatest Foreign Policy Tragedy, which is an insider account of why we invaded Iraq. Co-hosting with Pete is Mark Safransky. Mark is the creator of Zen Pundit, which is a blog dedicated to dissecting the intersections of foreign and defense policies, national security policies, and strategic thinking. It's very highly regarded, and the contributors are among the best, brightest, and most experienced. Now, speaking of experienced, we'd like to invite you to support our favorite cause, Save the Brave. You can read about them at savethebrave.org. They are a certified 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to helping veterans cope with post-traumatic stress. You can read about them on their website, donate a few bucks you're not using. Pete and I both support Save the Brave with our recurring contributions right out of our PayPal accounts. And Scott Husing supports them too. And he serves on their board. They do great work and we urge you to support them We also urge you to support whatever cause you see doing great work. Jump in. Help out. It feels great. We'd also like you to support the Break It Down show. So wherever you're listening to the show, iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, YouTube, help us out with a five-star rating and a positive review. It helps new listeners find us, and we really appreciate you doing it. And we really appreciate you listening. You can rate us and review us without even taking a break from listening. So do that. While you enjoy this episode with our guest today, Dr. Mike Mazar. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbin. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan East. This is Sebastian Yoder. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is Michael Mazar talking about the Iraq decision process on the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, this is a fantastic thing. I mean, I love, so first off, I love talking about Iraq because I've got unique perspective with uh, my many, many, many years in uh, missions on the ground. So being able to talk at the strategic and administration level with someone who studied this is perfect. And then if I'm going to have a co-host come in who's going to augment what I don't know about anything that happens above the brigade level, it's going to be Mark Zafransky, a.k.a. Zen Pundit, who I finally got him on the show. I'm so stoked (laughs) about this. And Mark is an expert in all things Nixon and National Security Council. So you're going to hear some high level talk. But as we always do, we're going to brush that against the reality of ground truth. So I'm mostly going to let Mark ask questions because uh, we've read the book and Mark has great thoughts on what's about to happen. So, Mark, I'm going to let you talk to Mike and then I'm going to jump in where I need to. Okay, Mike, you've got a great book here, Leap of Faith, Hybris, Negligence and America's Greatest Foreign Policy Tragedy, which is a dramatic title. So I thought maybe we would begin by just having you kind of explain to the listeners Why should Iraq be viewed as a foreign policy tragedy, which I agree with you it is, but why is it a particularly momentous strategic blunder for the United States? Thanks. It's a a good place to start, a good question to start with. I think a couple of reasons. Basically, the concept of tragedy that reappears a number of times in the book is not just that it's a disaster, but that tragedy is the result of some kind of human flaws on the part of the people making the judgments that lead to that outcome. And so that's one reason why I think we should view it as a tragedy is, for example, it's not a crime per se. It's not just a mistake. It is in very classical sort of tragic terms, uh, the result of some of the particular flaws of the people making the decisions. But then in terms of the impact of it, the only modern equivalent that you could you could argue a bit about is Vietnam. But I would argue that yes. in the Iraq case, a much more avoidable, an error with colossal costs in terms of financial cost, human cost, and America's position in the world, and costs that we're still only now really fully understanding in terms of, for example, the mm-hmm. reactions of countries like North Korea and Russia 
that saw yes. the United States invade this country and made certain conclusions about how they had to counter American power. So we provoked a lot of reactions that we're only now really fully understanding. So enormous costs in a completely avoidable mistake. Hey, this is Pete. Real quick, I just want to let you guys know we are proud to announce our official support of Save the Brave, a certified nonprofit 501c3 with a charter of helping veterans with post-traumatic stress. Here's how you can help. Go to savethebrave.com, click on the link on the website, and my recommendation is this. Subscribe. Give them 20 bucks a month. You've got subscriptions that you can turn off right now that you're not using that are $20 a month. Swap that out. Get involved. Let's help these folks out. We provoked a lot of reactions that we're only now really fully understanding. So enormous costs in a completely avoidable mistake. Yeah, completely avoidable is an excellent way of putting it. You use a term policy negligence to try and characterize the, the magnitude of this failure. Could you explain a little bit what you mean by policy negligence? Yeah, I came to that, you know, like I mentioned in the book, because uh, there was one of the people I interviewed was a, a senior U.S. official working at the time. And several years afterward, he was just infuriated by some of the actions of the Rumsfeld Pentagon and to some extent Cheney and others. Mm -hmm. And he he described it as criminal negligence. When I first heard that, I didn't give it all that much thought. But then when I was sort of working on the book and thinking about how to conceptualize the nature of the actions of some of the folks involved, I went back and looked up this legal concept of negligence. And it really matches, I think, the flaws in the decision process. Because what it basically refers to is a situation where you have a group of decision makers who have some kind of established responsibility for other people in some way. So like, yes. you know, the Ford Motor Company has responsibility for people that are going to buy their cars because they make an implicit promise that they'll be safe. And people that by the standard of a common person violated their obligation to those people. And that's basically negligence. And I go into some more specific legal language and, and basically came to the conclusion that the actions of most senior officials in the Bush administration satisfy the, the criteria of criminal negligence. Now, that is not to suggest, and I don't argue in the book, that they should be prosecuted. But rather, what I'm trying to argue is the same as with McNamara and others in the Vietnam case, the same as with U.S. officials who uh, brought about things like the Bay of Pigs fiasco. How do you hold senior national security officials responsible when they're not just trying to do their best with limited information, they are actually negligent. And I think the case clearly indicates that they were. Yeah, I tend to agree with you on that. And I think the public, there is a sense in this country that, that people who operate in Washington, D.C. And, and some other areas of national leadership, such as the economy, have not been accountable for their actions in recent years or perhaps even a decade and that they create disasters and shift the costs and go on with their careers completely unimpeded. And that's not healthy for a democracy. I agree entirely. And I think it's, you know, uh, there's a big difference. And this is what I try to get at in the last chapter is, you know, these, these issues, it's not like an engineering problem. And in most cases, it's not, you know, I argue that this was not a case of consciously hoodwinking the American people. I think that mm -hmm. the senior officials really believed they were doing the right thing for the country. And if yeah. something went wrong, I, there are a lot of people that would say, well, they were trying to do their best, except they didn't do their best. And in no. very demonstrable ways, at the time, there were warnings, there was evidence that they simply did not adequately respond to. And if you're a commander of a battalion and you do something like that, you can be relieved for cause. Why is there no accountability at the level of the Secretary of State or National Security Advisor for the same type of mistakes that would get an operational commander thrown out? Or, or a private. You get in more trouble Yeah, exactly. Your, your rifle than losing a war. Right. And, and it's, it's very sad. I want to jump in and ask a question then. So one of the things when we look back, we, we miss a couple of big things in general as, as we all look at post 9-11 action. I submit that regardless of who had won the presidency, whether it was Al Gore or George Bush, neither of those guys, there was no candidate who was prepared 
to deal with a post 9-11 response. So could Gore have put together a better NSC or what could have changed to give the Bush administration a chance to do something other than negligent? I mean, granted, it did not work out the way we wanted, but was a positive outcome even possible? Yeah. So I think two parts of that that you're talking about, I think we can kind of pull apart. One is the general post 9-11 counterterrorist response, and the other is specifically Iraq. So on the second one, there's a lot of debate. And in fact, one scholar wrote a whole book on the question of whether Al Gore would have invaded Iraq, just like Bush did. That book comes to the conclusion that he would have. Uh, you know, there were certain Al Gore by the end of the Clinton administration was certainly one of the Iraq hawks in the Clinton crowd. The Democratic Party's platform uh, in that election was even more hawkish on Iraq than the Republicans were. However, my gut is that they would have found a way to to use leverage after 9-11 to get a lot of concessions out of Saddam Hussein in terms of inspections, but that a Gore administration would not have launched the kind of invasion that we saw. So in that sense, the question of the difference is just like whether the president himself was likely to have made a different judgment. Like you were saying before, the, the people in the Bush administration were tremendously experienced. And so it's hard to imagine that a Gore NSC would have had more experienced senior officials. I like to think they would have seen some of the potential downsides of that differently. Now, then there's the other question of what sort of war on terror would they have put together? That is a complete unknown, right? Whether they would have talked about a global agenda. I you know, happen to think that as serious as 9-11 was, as enormous and tragic and horrific, and as much as the United States had to go out into the world and annihilate Al-Qaeda in response, that the way the war on terror was conceived was way exaggerated and ended up really working against U.S. interests. And I like to think that maybe a Gore administration would have found a way to have a very powerful and decisive response that stopped short of where we eventually went, which was to kind of hijack U.S. foreign and defense policy for 15 years. But all that is a hunch, right? We can't know what they would have done differently. And I don't think, to your question, the people or the structure of the NSC would have really been the decisive factor as much as the president's own kind of instincts. The Bush doctrine obviously is born from this and already kind of comes out of the chute a little bit wobbly, right? It's not a good spiral yeah. pass because we're like we're going to go after right. terrorists everywhere except for Saudi Arabia, except for Ireland, except for except, you know, it's like, well, OK, <laughs> like, I get exactly. it. we're going to be proactive. And then the gosh, I don't know, we'll just say nice. We'll say the benevolent intention that everybody wants freedom missing and all of us probably would have missed this missing the fact that what we decide describe as freedom individually is going to be wildly different from country to country would there have been a gore doctrine i mean would they have said you know because president bush sort of said enough's enough we, we're tired of always waiting for something to happen we're gonna bring it to you which, which i think in theory is an excellent approach to something that you just can't wrestle down i mean if you look around the room on on 9 12 hardly anybody knows about the quran in america hardly anybody knows Arabic. right so yeah i mean calling them negligent i get it and i think it's very fair but again same kind of question is is was gore prepared to have the proper response and i just i, I don't know i really think that the the political pressures after 9 11 would have compelled Gore to essentially invade Afghanistan. I don't think any president could have avoided that kind of pressure with thousands of Americans dead and the Pentagon struck by a plane and another plane crashed in Pennsylvania. The question for me, and you touch on this a little bit in, in the book, is if a Gore administration would have overlooked the deep ties between Pakistan's intelligence services and al-Qaeda and the Taliban in quite the same cavalier way that the Bush administration did. I really don't know if they would have taken the same sort of tack with Musharraf that we did when we sent Richard Armitage there, and the Pakistanis essentially agreed to be a road while charging very high tolls for U.S. troops and supplies to go to Afghanistan. But a large part of what was happening in Afghanistan was being directed from Pakistan. And the Pakistanis bore responsibility, and essentially we will, we let them off the hook. 
Yeah, I mean, and I don't know. So as you know, well, a lot of the reasons for that are kind of embedded in the strategic situation in the region and the U.S. relationship with Pakistan and the fact that Pakistan has a lot of significance for us, even outside the counterterrorism realm, right? Like we don't, that old problem that we, you know, threats of withholding aid and other kinds of things, which we, of course, have done at different times, but it's like, it's not in the U.S. interest to destabilize Pakistan. So, and and they know that. And so there's limits on, I mean, I think where you're going is really interesting counterfactual in the sense that let's suppose um, Paul Wolfowitz is shouting to go to Iraq from outside government and the Gore people are like, (laughs) no, we're not doing that. But you're, I think you're absolutely right. If we give the same ultimatum to the Taliban, and they eventually turn it down, then we're going in. Absolutely, we're going in. The question then becomes like, okay, if you're not going to do Iraq afterward, and I think there's a chance, and and given my own views, I think there's a risk that the Mm -hmm. Gore group would have been even more unconditionally devoted to nation building than the Bush crowd eventually got to. Because, of course, Rumsfeld is trying as hard as he can to avoid doing that in Afghanistan, right? Which is why we abandon the place as soon as we get there. So if you have a different situation where there is not a global declaration of war, but there is a declaration of war against Al Qaeda and anybody that is directly supporting them, if you have an honest interrogation of the intelligence, which at least on the terrorism ties piece very clearly showed, and nobody denies this, that the intelligence community's word back at the British word back, everybody's word back was Saddam does not have a a meaningful operational connection to al-Qaeda at all. And if anything, he thinks of them as almost as much of a threat as we do. So if they go into Afghanistan and say, you know, we're going here and no further, we'll hunt down al-Qaeda anywhere. And now that we are here, we're going to start making the kind of immediate investments that the Bush people did not. Now, Given the difficulties of nation building in Afghanistan, they may, that may not have got us into any better place than we are right now anyway. But oh, to me, yeah. that's the most like reasonable alternate possibility is that that's the yeah. kind of approach they would have taken. I think that's very plausible. And I really, really think it probably nation building wouldn't have worked any better. Pete can right. speak to that since he actually was attempting to do it yeah. in, in Zabel, I believe didn't go terribly well it's a powerful point mark because if the theoretic gore presidency was to have gone and would have been heavily focused on nation building maybe they would have done better but there's an ethos problem with commanders and what they have to prepare for when they go on the ground and it's really easy to overinvest in afghanistan and find yourself in really dangerous situations i mean the platoons i worked with if you went more than 45 minutes away you know, so let's call it two miles, you're really in jeopardy of being ambushed because there's no help coming, not in any kind of reasonable mm-hmm. time frame. And you only need so many of those to undermine an entire administration and, and, and not win re-election. The other thing is, and this is just, I'm going to say this is just a ground truth fact now, because I've done this with a number of people, and I'm talking special operators, people that go out and kick doors for a living. And Without exception, every everyone that I've interviewed on the show and talked to, and, and I'm in the same boat, we've all said the same thing. We had way more conversations than we ever fired bullets out of our gun in these in Iraq and Afghanistan. And you think about that and how we actually prepare to fight, and you put that against nation building, and it just doesn't make sense that we don't spend the same kind of, of detailed, tactical, knowledge-based training on talking to people, working an interpreter, understanding what nation building is as a goal, how to win hearts and minds for the government, not for ourselves. That's the whole wrong orientation. So when we look at that part of it, the machine itself couldn't accomplish what President Bush or the uh, the theoretic President Gore presidencies would want to have happen because we just, we were never going to be able to put that kind of capacity on the ground. No, I agree. And I mean, as you know better than me, the, the system tried to adjust then, right, over the next decade. And eventually you got national training center rotations where people are going out trying to practice the things that you're talking about. But, you know, I think and then going back to a lot of the literature from the Vietnam era and, and in general, I think to me, you could have an, an outside army that's really well trained in that stuff. 
But the two factors that leap out of all the research and I think our, our practical experience in Afghanistan is, number one, if the government you're trying to support is not inherently effective and honest and kind of, you know, respected by, doesn't have the allegiance of the majority of the people. And number two, if there is an outside sponsor of the insurgency, if those two things are going against you, you know, obviously you're running way uphill, which is kind of the dilemma. So like, in a way, I think for all of his faults, Rumsfeld was on to something when he gave his beyond nation building speech in February of 2003 and saying basically, you know, this is really hard to do. It often doesn't work and we want to avoid it if we can. So, but the problem is both in Afghanistan and Iraq, we get in with this halfway mindset, right? Of like, well, we don't really want to do it, but we kind of have to. And then years later, like, you know, when I was working in the Pentagon, we're doing Afghan policy. And the dilemma then is you're like, well, we, we have certain political goals that the political leaders want us to achieve. But in order to achieve those, you can't do that with a light footprint approach. You can avoid nation building and schwack some bad guys who crop up, but that's not going to get you where you think you need to go to really stabilize the place. So there's hard choices I think we weren't willing to make at the beginning, really hard choices. Like we're going to go in, clean the place out, we're going to leave, and we have zero responsibility for what goes on there afterwards. Or we're going to go in and really do it right for 30 or 40 or 50 years. And nobody was willing to make either of those choices, which left us where we were. It's very, very hard for Americans in our political culture to embrace openly punitive rating on the British format, which was how they handled literally the Afghans when they ran India. Your book does a really awesome job of weaving together the interplay between personal failures of individual policymakers, the cognitive problem of groupthink that was going on, and the cultural background that reinforced that. One of the things that leapt out for me in your book was you were citing uh, Walter McDougall's diplomatic history book, excellent book, Promised Land Crusader State. Right. And our messianic tradition in foreign policy. Could you explain a little bit how that influences policymakers of either party when they approach foreign policy? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, McDougall's argument, the argument of lots of other people, right, is that basically from the founding, the United States has a a missionary conception of its role in the world as a country, that we're not just another country, we are an exceptional country. And in some people's mind, we're a country that's been chosen by God to bring the example and the message of freedom to the community of nations. And of a course, city on, for city on the Hill as the initial conception, right? As the initial, yeah. like, so, so at first, because we're not a world power and we're still isolationist, it is doing that by example, mostly, is that our, our missionary role is to provide an example for others to follow and maybe offer a little bit of help on the margins. But so it, it's really not until... I mean, of course, you begin to see the transition with the Spanish-American War, and then Mm -hmm. from there through 1945-50, you've got the bubbling up uh, initially among a certain, I think, elite class resisted by more popular opinion. Then eventually, with the end of World War II, you've got to make this, this full transition to the United States having a world role. So now, all of a sudden, if you're a missionary power with predominant global power and a new global and level of global engagement, then you're going to interpret your missionary responsibilities very differently. During the Cold War, it becomes obvious. And then the real precursor to Iraq is the end of the Cold War and the emergence of this uh, liberal interventionist concept, which mm-hmm. joins both kind of neoconservatives and, and progressives into the idea that Now it's time for the United States to go around the world and intervene in various places to clean up messes and promote certain values. So by the time Iraq comes around, that underlying idea, which is really taken for granted by so many people and still today, means that when a lot of folks you would expect to be more skeptical of this, whether they are kind of conservatives who've become neocons or at least buy into the hard edge of that missionary responsibility, 
or liberals who you would think might be opposed to the use of force, you get all kinds of people supporting this who, in retrospect, I mean, on the one hand, you know, George Will on the conservative side has yes. become a big critic of the Iraq war. But at the time, he was a huge cheerleader. This is yes, a guy who is steeped in conservative thinking that ought to have told him why these ambitions were kind of overweening. And then you got liberals like the public intellectual Michael Ignatiev, like the editor of The New Yorker, like the editorial board of The Washington Post, to the whatever extent they're liberal, who end up editorializing in favor of this because they think that it's going to promote democracy. So, you know, I think Iraq is an example of how these underlying agreed norms in society or values in the political realm make it much easier for people who want to advocate for a certain course of action to have everybody look around and say, well, yeah, that kind of makes sense because that's what we do. It passed that smell test at the time because of that missionary sensibility. So essentially, if you are sitting as a, as a staffer on the National Security Council, or you are a mid-career foreign service officer at the State Department, or you were in the uh, office of the Secretary of Defense as a deputy assistant, you're already coming in with this framework and worldview not to question interventionist assumptions. Yeah, for the most part. And that's, you know, as I mentioned in the book, one of the most common responses that, that skeptics would get when they would raise problems with this is, you just don't get it. You just yes. don't get it. It's like this idea that there's a general consensus here that this is how America uses its power. So if you don't get that, then you better go off somewhere and you know get out of the mainstream because this is what everybody believes. Haven't you seen? Even the Washington Post is calling for this war. So yeah, absolutely, that the vast majority of, of folks have that underlying Notion, And then it kind of gets married to this other underlying assumption about Iraq's pursuit of weapons of mass destruction, which even people who didn't believe in the war, there were very, very few people who seriously questioned the basic assumption that he was really, really dangerous because of that WMD piece and something ought to be done about him. So there were a number of these kind of underlying belief system is that if you were going to argue against this war, you had to attack all this stuff. And it was a big task. Correct. That's the one area where you can probably give the Bush administration the biggest buy is the belief about Saddam's weapons of mass destruction and his programs, and especially the things that are easier to conceal, like biological weapons. That was shared widely by world leaders, including those who are opposed to the invasion of Iraq. They didn't doubt it based on Saddam's past performance and the games that he was playing with UN inspectors. It, it yeah, seemed that, like concealing things. That's right. I mean, most people agree that there was you know, a lot of difference about the level of urgency. And there were definitely folks in the United Kingdom, for example, who thought their supposed dodgy dossier was, was BS because they didn't think it was that extreme. I will say, as I argue in the book, that from the very first time at the beginning of the administration, the first intelligence briefing that Condi Rice got on the WMD issue, having talked to people in the, who were in the room, the reaction was the same as every official had when they were given the full up, here's all the intel we have briefing. And that reaction was, where's the good stuff? You know, we all have this <laughs> assumption. So if, if, if this assumption is really true, I would think we'd have more than that. You know, where's where's the, you know, signals intercept of Saddam telling somebody, hey, bury, you know, put all those mobile biological labs over here or whatever. They just didn't have. And to me, there were multiple opportunities, like there were multiple occasions where senior officials and this is, you know, like I point out in there, this is the reason for the infamous slam dunk quote from George Tenet, because they, they yeah. brief Bush and his reaction is. That ain't going to do it. Where's the stuff that I can use to actually persuade the American people? And so Tenet says, oh, it's a slam dunk, Mr. President, which is, of course, exactly the opposite he should be saying. As an intelligence professional, he should be saying, well, if you have doubts, that's a really good signal. And maybe that means we need to you know, look into this a little more carefully. But there were lots of opportunities where senior officials got this sense that something is not right here. There should be a lot more. And, you know, in retrospect, it's not that much of a leap to say, you know what, I'm going to have a few people really look into this 
and run it into the ground and come back and tell me, is this a high confidence case or is there something mm -hmm. going on? And they never did that. Let me ask, in the room, there's a lot of different opinions. There's a lot of different people talking. Uh, you know, they're all trying to solve, again, this impossible problem. So, I mean, if I wanted to pick a fight, you know, obviously you've got to go deal with Afghanistan at some point, right? But that largely could be handled by special forces, at least initially, right? That's mm -hmm. what we're going to think in this room. But I really want to put maneuver units on the ground with a guy who's proven to be an asshole with the UN, not doing what he's supposed to do, has broken all these rules. And also, I don't want to know what happens the minute Saddam dies and, you know, one of his crazy kids takes over. You know, I, I can see there being someone that's like, if we're going to choose out of a shitty option, yeah, we don't have what we want in terms of the uh, SIGINT, but man, this is more preferred than, you know, going and slogging through jungle combat somewhere or whatever it is. Yeah. Well, partly what you're getting at is idea of just exercising power. And there were definitely folks in the administration and, and Thomas Friedman editorialized about this in the New York Times saying basically Afghanistan isn't going to be big enough that yeah. the lesson that America needs to teach the world requires a bigger threat to be taken down. And I mean, I don't think that's that argument. And I'm not saying you're making this argument. Right. I think it, it's true that there was a lot of things about the Afghan, the looming Afghan commitment that they were really worried about in terms of how quickly it would go, how messy it would be, all that business. But there are a lot of assumptions embedded with this idea that, you know what, it's really time to teach the world that if you screw with these people, we're coming to get you. That would be true if they really had, you know, if Saddam was saying, yeah, I'm sheltering these people and you can't have them and whatever. But given the lack of intelligence on, on real connections, I think that this idea that some people in the administration had that it was time for America to scare the crap out of the world, that was never tested. I mean, at a minimum, even if you think that's true, then write a policy paper on it and let's have a debate because the, the evidence for that in the history of international relations is really mixed. When you make the world fear that you're going to imminently invade them, you, you unleash a lot of dynamics that you can't control. So I think that that's, that was definitely part of the thought process of some of the people involved. And I think it was a, just a big untested assumption that guided part of what they did. One of the things that leapt out for me was early in the, in the book, in Leap of Faith, they discussed how the National Security Council process, where, where these things are supposed to be hashed out, along with the interagency process. And President Bush was not interested in option papers. And mm -hmm. When you don't have option papers, or at least a set of options, the president is not getting the best possible advice from the national security related agencies because their views are simply going unrepresented and in specious or off the wall or politically unsustainable ideas are sailing through without adequate review. And that just seemed from the get go to be a recipe for disaster. It's the president doesn't want to hear uh, what he doesn't want to hear. And that's a really bad message in any organization, much less the U.S. government. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And, and the tragic thing about Bush is, you know, on the one hand, I talked to a number of people who said he liked to pride himself on being a person who did welcome all kinds of different contrary opinions. And there are specific cases where. He did stand up for people uh, either in the policy side or the intelligence side who offered some views and got yelled at by people in Cheney's <laughs> office or Rumsfeld's <laughs> office. And Bush would come back around and say, no, I'm glad you told me that. I'm glad we had that discussion. On the other hand, mm. I think people operating in his name and also because of his lack of curiousness, there's absolutely no question that the belief on the part of most people in the process was if you raise your head up and say this is a bad idea, you will get your head shot off. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. 
and also because of his lack of curiousness, there's absolutely no question that the belief on the part of most people in the process was if you raise your head up and say this is a bad idea, you will get your head shot off. Yes. So somehow it's a really tragic example of how a powerful added or, or sense that represses contrary thinking can arise even when the senior leader doesn't fully intend it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But others in the process clearly did. And they made clear that folks who registered opposing views felt like they were going to get punished. And it's striking because you've mentioned Vietnam a couple of times. There, there is no George Ball figure in right. the story. And LBJ was not someone who, who took bad news well. He, yeah. he, he bullied the chiefs of staff. He physically threw uh, a Marine general. I think it was Krulak, out of his office by the seat of his pants. He bullied and berated George Ball, but Ball persisted. There's nobody in this story who's showing the same sort of moral courage that George Ball did. No, that's true. And I think partly because there wasn't anybody who thought that getting rid of Saddam was actually a bad idea. I mean, the closest yeah. person, of course, is is Colin Powell and, and yeah. one of the most interesting and difficult and complex cases in this decision process. And, and, you know, in August of 2002, he asked for that meeting with Bush, but he doesn't go in and, and give him a whatever, 74 page George Ball memo saying why this is a bad idea. <laughs> he just says there are risks. You better be willing to accept them. And my interviews were anonymous, so I, but I can say people I did not talk to, and Powell is one of those I did not get a chance to interview. He's given plenty of interviews about this and talked about it, but I think you know, he had a very similar experience in the first Gulf War, where as a military officer at the time, tried to offer some views that maybe this was going to be a costly war, we should avoid if we could, and giving economic sanctions a chance to work was a good idea. And he initially got really put in his place by Cheney, Sekdef at the time, yep. who said, you're out of your lane. But then later on, working through Scowcroft, and then Cheney kind of relented a little bit, Bush got the opportunity to make his case to the president that waiting was better. And Bush Sr. said, I get it, but I don't think we can wait anymore. But I think that he has in his mind that idea that it's not his job to argue against the president, certainly once he believes a decision has been made. And kind of laying out the risks would be enough. But, you know, it's, a, it's just an amazing, like, counterfactual question to say, if Condoleezza Rice had really gotten persuaded by a lot of this stuff and had gone to him privately, as she had the power to do, given his enormous respect for her, and said, Mr. President, here's a two-page memo. you got to read this. And I'm telling you right now, we are not ready to do this. It may be a right thing to do eventually, but... The, the planning and everything else is not in the right place, and it's going to be a disaster, and you cannot think about doing this in the next few months because we're just not prepared to do it. You know, obviously, Rumsfeld would have gone berserk and <laughs> would have probably tried to get her fired, among other things. Yes. And he would have, he would have retaliated with a thousand pages of Defense Department memos saying we're prepared to do everything. And in a way, she did kind of do this, like we talked about. She... She did convey some message that I'm, I'm concerned that we're not quite ready. And then Rumsfeld and Franks come back and say, yeah, everything's great. And as the national security advisor, that puts you in a very difficult position. But you're absolutely right that there was nobody who, like in England, there were a couple of senior officials that resigned in protest yes. before the war. There was nobody in this process who even really said I'm going to throw my career on this fire and I'm going to go to the president and I'm going to say you can't do this. You do not want to do this. There was just nobody who did that, in part because there really wasn't anybody who believed it that strongly. Mm. Well, it's interesting. You have um, a lot of, of off-the-record sources in your book, a little, bit, a little bit like Bob Woodward does. And I kind of think I know who some of them are, but the tenor of the remarks shows, one, they're still very angry about how this process unfolded even now. And two, they're still not willing to come out on the record when really now it's a historical decision case. And they're probably in the twilight years of any possible career or appointing positions. 
they spoke to you and it's good that they did, but they're still not really willing to make that public reassessment. Well, I would say probably a lot of them would have, but the, the fact that I did the interviews anonymously, unfortunately, was an artifact of the fact that I started this research, although I did not finish it, working in an academic environment. So I was teaching at the oh. National War College at the time. Okay. And the result is that, as you probably know, academic environments are obsessive about human subjects protection. Yes. And yes, they it are. would, particularly because I started to do I mean, for good reasons in some cases, but I started to do the research. I took a long time to do this book. So I started to do the research just several years after the war started when at a time when, like, especially if you're in the Republican Party, it would definitely be problematic if you're seen as jumping off of the ship at that point. So I, I would have had very a very difficult time trying to get approval through the board that I had to get approval to do the research from to do on the record interviews. So that's why I just started and then left it as anonymous, not because definitely there were some people early on and throughout who, you know, it, given the questions they asked me, it was clear that they would only do it if it was off the record. Yes. But I bet there were there were a fair number of people that would have been happy to do it on the record. And certainly, as you say, later on, go back to them and say, okay, now can I quote you on the record? But it was just it was the fact that it was uh, I had to go through this thing called an institutional review board. Yes. That's why I did it that way. OK. Very interesting. It changes my impression a little bit, but I didn't realize the book transitioned for that period. Of time. Right. By the way, your your end notes are very rich. So anyone out there who is a, is a wonk, you will enjoy reading Michael's end notes as much as you will enjoy reading the book at times. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I tried to I tried to leave the book itself as accessible to non wonks as possible. So yeah, the end notes are extensive. Let me uh, you know, pay the bill a little bit here. You guys can get all of Michael's work on Amazon. Just Michael J. Mazar. You can find it M A Z A R R. You can definitely grab him on Twitter at M Mazar. And then if you can't find him at P. Day Turner, at Zen Pundit, you, you'll, we'll get you linked up to him. But there's quite a bit of work there. I mean, obviously, we're talking about Iraq and those decisions right now. But there's there's things on North Korea and other policy type things. So if you look up Michael's work, you will see that he's worked at RAND, which is probably the best place to look you up. Right, Michael? So RAND.org and then look for his name. But he's associated with a lot of really smart places doing a lot of really, really smart things. And so when he's putting all of this stuff together, it's sort of a modern history of, uh, well, I love the title, Leap of Faith, Hubris, Negligence, and America's Greatest Foreign Policy Tragedy. Hubris is absolutely, let me just say this as a caveat, foreign policy is really hard to get right. You're, you've got a con context of your time, and then history starts changing everything the moment you leave office. So can we even have good foreign policy right now? Because, look, who would have thought that uh, <laughs> President Obama would have come in post-Bush, you know, elected in at least a significant portion because he wasn't that, right? And so he comes in and he's like, right. I'm going to follow the Bush doctrine. I'm going to kill people with my remote control airplanes. I'm going to bust down their doors in the middle of the night and snatch them up and just be like just the, the death bombing is like overlord you, you could ever imagine. I mean, what a change. Uh, but because he started out like, hey, I'm going to reach my hand out to Iran and all these other places. But he uh, he also vaporized a lot of people. Is foreign policy just not something that we can even do well anymore? Well, I think, you know, I think we certainly can do it better. I think. Part of it is that Bush through Obama were kind of operating on fumes in a way. We're kind of operating on the legacy of, you know, American global primacy at the end of the Cold War. And for a while, I think we got out of the sense of having to think about statecraft. You know, it's like we we're, we're kind of in charge of the world. So our job is to figure out just what to tell people to do and where to send military forces to expand the boundaries of our exceptional quasi empire. And that doesn't require a lot of priority setting. It doesn't require balancing different. So I do think we've gotten out of the habit a bit, to the extent that we're ever really in it, of really thinking about statecraft and having a really thoughtful strategy and conception about the, what the U.S. role in the world is, having that conception in the mind of a president and, I think, a secretary of state 
I think you've got to have a secretary of state that is leading American statecraft and diplomacy. The national security advisor can be a great kind of leader of strategic thinking and manager of an interagency process, and then have some really energetic initiatives to put all that into place. And yeah, I don't think, I mean, partly it's that for very good reasons, certainly since 2008, we've been very focused on domestic affairs. And I think, you know, we've got to continue that to revitalize the basis for our international power. But and you look at the president, you look at a lot of the foreign policy debate in the last election, in the forthcoming election, there's just not a lot of fundamentals there. There's not a lot of here's how to think about America's role in the world. Here's my concept for how we can do good without doing too much. And so, yeah, I, I, I definitely, you know, agree. I think Obama certainly had a variety of initiatives besides vaporizing people and you know, with the the agreement with Iran and trying to keep relations with Russia on an even keel, other kinds of things. I think they were trying to do more or less the right thing, but we've definitely gotten out of the habit of real statecraft. And I think the clock is ticking on how long we have to be able to pick up that habit again. Every president gets the National Security Council and decision-making structure that they want but very few of them get the one they need or deserve. What would you advise that the next president or the current president do in terms of setting up a system so that they can make better statecraft decisions than, than have happened in, let's say, the last eight to 15 years? So the first thing I would recommend is the president, the, the, the prospective president during a primary, during a campaign, during a transition needs to have tons of discussions about foreign policy, needs to educate themselves if it's not their background, at least a little bit on what, I mean, not international relations theory, but what some of the main contending approaches are. And they need to come to their own judgment about what they really think. Because like you say, president gets the security apparatus that they want or that sort of flows from their habit of decision-making but also one of the big lessons of the last few presidents is the practical outcomes in foreign policy are a product of the president's instincts. And if those instincts are not consistent or they're not educated or whatever, then that's where it all starts. You can't, there's a limited degree to which you can make up for that with a good structure. That to me is one of the yeah. big lessons of Iraq. It's one of the big lessons actually of the financial crisis, which is that the structure of risk management doesn't prevent human error. So, so the, the, the first step is a president debating and educating and thinking about it enough that they feel like, okay, I've decided that my vision of America is you know, engaged, but not interventions or whatever they think. Then step number two, find a powerful, energetic, brilliant person with great judgment <laughs> who shares that basic worldview to be your secretary of state and vest them with the leadership of American statecraft. They are the leading spokesperson. They are the person that runs American foreign policy. Third step then is decide on exactly how you want your national security process to work under that. And there's different models I think that can work well, but most importantly, you want an NSC whose primary job is to ensure interagency coordination in a way that more than ever before, we need the different instruments of statecraft working together in harmony. So to me, the primary function of the NSC is that coordinating role. So me personally, I would love to see a strong Secretary of State with, for example, a policy planning staff at state that is the main strategic thinking engine of the government on foreign policy, and an NSC with an NSC advisor who is a great manager of the process and an NSC whose primary job is to catalyze a lot more interagency coordination, including bringing a lot of departments into issues that they haven't been involved with before, because now in this you know gray zone competition below mm. the threshold of war, we got to get everybody on board. So that's kind of you know, I, but the, the the problem with that to me and what like the Iraq case and some other cases really reflect is it'd be a lot easier if it was just a matter of here's the org chart for your NSC that will solve all your problems. 
Yes. But it doesn't, you know, that's not it. It is about yeah. people and ideas ultimately. And if you get them wrong, I think there's nothing structurally you can do about it. Let me push you on your design a little bit too, because this is where, you know, my ground truth lens comes into play. You can pick super smart people. I've watched Kennedy School of Graduate pe government people sit in front of an Afghan leader who is the boss in that area and roll their eyes at that person in front of that Afghan leader's peers. And you just want to slap the shit out of them. Be like, yeah. hey, <laughs> makes me instantly No, mad. You, so, so this, is, this is a problem is, you know, and I've given a lot of thought over the last few years yeah, yeah. to the meaning of the word judgment. Uh-huh. And, you know, and having worked at the War College for 12 years, and I can tell you, you know, the kind of experiences you had, the thing that sparked me to write this book was interacting with all of these military officers, intelligence, you know, operations officers, and foreign military officers, State Department people, USAID folks who had been in on the ground and seen exactly the kind of things you're talking about, and, and even in spades, as I know you saw too, and, and asking myself, okay, these were some of the most experienced foreign policy people in American history. How did they possibly produce these kind of ridiculous outcomes? So, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's not a matter of Harvard graduates. It's, you know, I think that one of the challenges is that, and I think, you know, it's interesting because like, I think this relates to certainly in the military, beyond the military too, but certain professional military education in the selection of senior officers, the education the selection of senior officers, we're really seeking people who ultimately at the strategic level make really good judgments. Mm. But we don't know what it looks like to make good judgments while the making is going on, right? Yeah. There is some evidence from psychologists and decision-making scholars and everything else, but I think we need to get a lot better at, for example, like here's, here's one example. There's a really interesting project, a guy named Phil Tetlock studies decision-making. He has something called the Good Judgment Project. And what they really do is forecasting. And they have these super forecasters, people that become super expert and, and they at, at forecasting events. Like if they'll ask in the next six months, you know, will Russia invade Belarus or whatever the question might be. And the interesting thing is they track their results, right? They actually <laughs> track what percentage of accuracy these people have. And then they can begin to examine what are the methods that are used by the people that are more accurate versus less. So they do that for this one little group of forecasters that they work with. We don't do that with prospective senior officials like the Harvard Kennedy School graduates you're talking about. Because yeah. some of those people, if you track their judgments over time, they'll be pathetic. And other people, you get a sense, and you know this, like you, you interact with somebody in a decision-making, a real operational environment for a while, and there are some of those people that you're just like, they, somehow they can integrate a lot of information. They can sum it all up. What Clausewitz calls the coup d'oeil, you know, this sort of the mm -hmm. vision or the glance. The judgments are not always right, but they are people you trust in a really complex situation to absorb it all and come out with something that's about the most pragmatic and best judgment you could get. There are ways of identifying people who have that more than others. But we don't do it. And I think in the national security side, we need to get better at overcoming that problem of saying like McGeorge Bundy is a great historical example, right? Thought of as a genius, Harvard professor and all this. And you put him in making these decisions on Vietnam and he's in, he's in there giving counsel that in retrospect is just crazy. Yeah. So figuring out the right people, I do think just from the thing I was talking about, finding one or a few people, finding a secretary of state, finding a national security advisor that reflect that kind of proven, good, pragmatic, real world judgment is something we have done in our history and we could do again. Michael, do we wait too long since you have a the war college background to start educating people in the pipeline about strategic thinking? and strategy, given that we have a tendency in bureaucracy to let people fail upward. Yeah. I know the military, the military is different from the civilian world, but, but you're not getting a heavy hitting strategy based education generally until you are a selected Lieutenant Colonel or, or the naval right. equivalent. And then most of those people will never go on and become a flag officer, general officer, I think it's maybe 5% of a graduating class will make their first star. We seem to be waiting a long time and we seem to be throwing a lot of talent away. 
So it is it's a it's a tough question. And I, you know, as kind of a quote unquote civilian strategist at the War College, my initial bias, yeah, was probably very much in the realm of let's turn them all into strategists. I mean, there is <laughs> there is a bit of a dilemma in that the fact of the matter is until they're about an 05 or so, nothing they're asked to do really has to do with strategy. That there is no question that early training and education has to focus on, you know, whatever their MOS is, whatever their operational specialties are, making them a great tactical officer because that's what they're doing. So to me, the question is, I wouldn't necessarily think we have to jam a bunch more strategy earlier in the pipeline as much as the problem to me is a different one, which is that and, and there's reasons for this, too, and, and it's possible to be very simplistic about this, and I don't mean to be critical of the thought process of a lot of senior officers, but the way you become a flag officer in your service is by conforming to the image of what a flag officer in your service is, hmm. not by being a great strategic thinker. And <laughs> oftentimes, the nature of – and this is you know just military institutions everywhere – the nature of the military institution is that – if you show yourself as being too much of a square peg for all these round holes by doing three different master's degrees in strategy and writing a book and all the rest of it, you know, on the one hand, people will say that's wonderful. And then quietly they'll say, you know, he or she is kind of a dweeb. I don't know if that's <laughs> the, the, what we need for an 08 or an 09 in our service. So there are, of course, people who manage to master both, who become the, you know, soldier scholars and there's some very big cultural problems as what well. problems that is maybe the wrong word cultural issues and you have to know what you want part of the reason why we want military strategists right now is the military is outside its lane all over the place partly mm -hmm. because of what you guys were asking about earlier right which is mm -hmm. kind of the decline of the the civilian you know i have enormous respect for a lot of the senior us commanders in the pacific right now i think we've got really a great team but as they probably would be the first to admit there should be a senior civilian diplomat running U.S. strategy in Asia. And there kind of is with an assistant secretary and this and that. But we have turned over so much of our foreign policy to uniformed officers in the combatant commands and elsewhere that I think if you correct for that a little bit, I think we very much are in an environment where you still want senior military officers who are deeply versed in strategy beyond just military operational questions. But there's a lot of ways to get at this problem besides just turning every military officer into a strategist. Because the other problem, like you say, the vast majority of 02s, 03s, 04s are never going to get to jobs where they – I mean, you say, yeah, everybody's a strategic corporal, and that's true to an extent. And you know, to the point about sitting opposite leaders in counterinsurgency context, you have to have kind of a more – you know, be versed in more than just military operational stuff for that. But now that that's a lower emphasis, I think the majority of people are not going to become the strategic leader. So then there's a question of selection, right, mm. is yes. how you get people to that top thing. So I think correcting for the militarization of foreign policy, dealing a bit with the selection problem of making sure that the people in those top jobs are the people who may not look like the poster child of an army or navy or whatever flag officer, but they're the best strategist for that job. I think you can do most of what you need to do with those kind of things without completely overhauling who's getting a strategic education at what phase. Yeah, I think still, like you said, the word strategy and strategist, you know, strategist over and over again, but we still have to. Here's what I learned. When I talked to generals, they would say, I just don't have enough of the ground truth. You know, like, yeah. there's no tacticalist. There's no grand tactical person. And, and I would say that the stuff I study, it's below the boots on the ground level because they come with an institutional lens that's warped. They've got a myopia, you know, and, and the commander comes in. And, and here was the big thing I learned in all of my time. I looked at an Afghan governor who we were trying to empower and get him to do his job. And he said, there's only room for one sword in the scabbard. There's not a commander alive that walks out of NTC going, I'm not the sword. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we have to have that rooting. We have to. It's it's not right. It's not full spectrum. It's spherical spectrum. And if you can't account, if you can't link 
your operations to the ground truth, where, where the work really is. People would come in all the time and say, fill the Tash Gill in Afghanistan, which for the audience is like, hey, let's, let's fill these government slots so the government can function. Well, that's cute, but completely removed what reality was. You know, so then you go talk to the farmers on the ground and you talk to the governor and the governor or someone, someone just super practical says, how long would your government work with no electricity? I don't know, eight minutes, you know? Right. (laughs) And so the governor's like, I don't have a budget. I I feed these guys myself. I'm supposed to have a budget, but I don't have any money, you know? So it doesn't matter how great your strategy is if uh, if there isn't a a tacticalist on the ground going, hey, uh, this guy says he's got no money. (laughs) Right. Well, it's right. It's the marriage between the two, right? It's like you got to have... Those folks who are expert in, and I do think, I mean, to your point, even apart from, so let's suppose we're kind of hopefully out of large scale stability or counterinsurgency operations for a while, we're still very much involved in engagement processes where, to me, I think the same lesson you're talking about applies when we're sending people in to do exercises with foreign militaries in Southeast Asia, is you can't send people in there saying, get out of the way. Let me tell you how this is going to be done or rolling their eyes or whatever. Right. That, that those kind of skills of those softer skills. Now, that, the, you know, challenge is, like you said, nobody comes out of a uh, basic officer course. Well, probably some do now, but most people come out thinking I'm a warrior and I fight things and people and that's what I do. And so hence, you know, the foreign area officer track problem and all of those kind of things. And they're having difficulty recruiting for the, the SFAB brigades because it's perceived as a career ender and nobody signed up for Afghan hands for the same reason. All that stuff. I think we need to create more of a sense that billets, jobs, careers that emphasize those, whether you call them softer skills or engagement skills or whatever they are, have a respected place in uniform that can get you anywhere you want to go. So, the only place I can think of for that would be the the Green Beret Army Special Forces who do unconventional warfare. They're the only ones who really seem to to do the emphasis on the linguistic skills, the cultural skills, and not have it be a career ender or a limiter. Yeah, well, that that has historically been uh, obviously the kind of yeah the the center of gravity of those that kind of thinking and. I think the army is, you know, they're working, they're, they're kind of realizing it and working. I mean, they, they're, they're part of the reason they created these security force assistance brigades was, I mean, part, part of it is structural and the kind of unit you need to do that mission. But I think part of it, too, is they're trying to work in that direction. We've got the same problem with cyber specialists and information operations specialists and all this. We're going to have to find ways to, to value those kind of career things. But, yeah, to your original point, clearly you got to have – the, the other side of the coin, right, is if you got the wrong strategy from the get-go, it almost yeah. doesn't matter how expert your tacticalists are. Yeah. They're going to fail. That's a great point just to put the flag in the ground and call that a great show, man. That is exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> a guy you should be aware of is a guy named Bill Mankins, soon to be double doctor Bill Mankins, and he's working on building a university that sort of works on these things, grand strategies, a theme, but also – you know, the ability to to look at flying a helicopter as a system and the compression of responsibility and a lot of different words. But he's working on trying to build this so you can get a degree in these kinds of problem sets. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see if he's able to pull it off. We pulled off a great episode here, and I hope you uh, hope you be interested in coming back because I, I, I think just this conversation was just the tip of the iceberg. We could have gone a different direction and done another hour plus e- easily. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to come back uh, anytime. It's a great you guys have a great mix of practical knowledge and strategic thinking, and it was a really fun discussion. Yeah, and no, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Great talking to you, Michael, and excellent book, Leap of Faith.